Hebrews 4, 12 and 13. For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to the dividing of soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give account. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Many of you probably noticed the very first week of your freshman year on campus. You discovered the forum wall by SIPO, and you headed over there and you saw a post and scribbled in the margins was the question, is this biblical? <laughs> freshman Nate Mulder and some of his buddies from Fisher 5 South, where are you guys? Oh, yeah. They recall a couple of these is this biblical questions from this past fall. Very first couple of weeks of campus, someone posted ideas for changing the Wheaton mascot. I didn't see it. Did you remember some of that? And they'd come up with different ideas, and someone wrote in the margins, is this biblical? Right. And then some guy posted a picture of his roommate with a dating resume. <laughs> and someone, of course, scribbled in the margins, is this biblical? And I guess just a couple of weeks ago, someone posted in the form wall a statement about why we need Trailless Tuesday, and someone asks, is this biblical? And who writes this stuff <laughs> all the time on the forum wall? It happens. Every year I've been here, this is my 19th year, it's always, is this biblical? Right? Well, I actually did some research, and I've got the answer, and we've got the picture right here. That's it. Scumbag Steve is writing, is this biblical? Yeah. You know, the longer you're on campus, you begin to notice the life cycle of this question. When you're first on campus, uh, it's sometimes you hear it as a serious question. Someone posts an opinion and, they, and then someone asks, well, is that really biblical? But then it turns from a serious question to a joke or punchline. And then it becomes a meme, a campus cliche tossed off without much consideration for context or relevance. Yeah, today is chicken fingers day, but is it biblical? You know, random. <laughs> is today chicken fingers day? Yes or no? Don't quote me on that. But within the life cycle, I notice a tendency. The serious question, is it biblical, tends to be a little bit accusatory, as if the question is a smackdown. Your view is not in Scripture. You better correct it, or you better not say it. And the humorous use has a sort of cynical expose quality. The Bible is somewhat irrelevant to whatever we're currently wrestling with, and we'll expose that by asking the question, is it biblical? Notice then that buried within our use of the question is the tendency to think of the Bible either as a source of limitations and restrictions, you can't say that, or perhaps a relatively unhelpful source of insight, as if the Bible is our etiquette book for proper Christian living, and we've located some issue that our etiquette guide just doesn't cover. It doesn't cover dating or mascots or chicken fingers. I'm most concerned when we take the question, what is it biblical, in its most accusatory sense as the attempt to deny or silence the honest exploration of issues, as if the Bible is a book that restricts and constrains rather than liberates. 
Those of us who grew up in the church and attend Christian institutions and Christian colleges, you know, we can build up a repertoire of Bible verses and Scripture lessons, and then we can actually craft these into some kind of finely wrought, elaborate prison cell, as if every verse becomes another bar in the construction of a jailhouse door. It's a jailhouse door constructed of bars of moralisms and warnings that over time can strip us of energy, of vitality, of intellectual curiosity, and at some point we just want to free the, and flee the Bible altogether. Like one of those days when the sun is shining, not like today, and you just want to get away and get out, and you hop in the car, and you rev up the engine, you roll down the windows, and you blast your stereo playing Leonard Skinner as loud as you can get, and you sing, I'm as free as a bird, and this bird you cannot change. Rock and roll, right? Okay. Is this view of the Bible accurate? Well, we want to answer no, but we often feel like answering yes. Uh, the theme, God's Word, in my story, uh, this is what I come down to. My experience, and I trust shaped by my meditation on Scripture, leads me to the following. The Bible isn't a jailhouse cell. It isn't a cage. It isn't protection from life. The Bible is not that. The Bible is embracing the destruction of whatever prison entraps us. Being biblical, deeply and truly biblical, is liberating because God's Word is more effective and more liberative than any other source, more than books of philosophies, more than music, more than art, more than communication, more than the pursuit of an identity. The Bible is more liberating than these. The Bible's also more, more dangerous than these. The people of Israel had been enslaved for nearly 400 years when we hear in Exodus 3 that Moses was approached, or Moses approached a burning bush, and Yahweh, through the power of His Word, promised Moses that His people would be liberated. Pharaoh had been exceptionally cruel to the Hebrew slaves, beating them for not working hard enough, and then giving them more work, and beating them for not doing the extra work. He even required all Egyptian citizens to take every firstborn Hebrew son and throw it into the Nile. Forty years after the burning bush, Moses liberated through God's word and God's power the people of Israel. And before crossing the Red Sea, he spoke to the people of Israel and he said to them to remember to tell generation after generation, by a strong hand the Lord has brought us out of Egypt, the house of slavery. God's Word is a liberating Word. But with liberation also comes openness and exposure to the world outside of control, routine, forced expectations. Liberation is an adventure, but it can be frightening. A month and a half after leaving Egypt, as the Israelites approached Mount Horeb near Mount Sinai, there's about 50 miles shy of that, they ran out of food. So Exodus 16, we find the report that the children of Israel claimed to Moses, we would rather die in slavery with food than starve in the wilderness. So God gave them manna. 50 miles later, they arrived at uh, the rock of Horeb, and they were out of water, and they said to Moses, why did you bring us here to die of thirst? So God gave them water from the rock of Horeb. They stayed in Mount Sinai for about a year, then moved east and north up to the southern border of the promised land. On this hard journey, they complained about the lack of meat, 
and they told Moses, in Egypt we had free fish. Now all we've got is manna. And in number 11, Numbers 11, we find the report that God sends them quail, meat. And indeed, in Numbers 13, the children of Israel send spies into the promised land. You remember, right? And the spies came back and said, yeah, this land is wonderful. It's beautiful. It's flowing with milk and honey. Indeed, it's the kind of land that a liberated people should have from someone like God who gives great power in his word. But, the spies said, the enemies are too big and too strong. And Numbers 14 reports their complaint. We'd rather die in slavery than die in the wilderness by the sword. In verse 3 of chapter 14 of Numbers, would it not be better, they ask Moses, for us to go back to Egypt? They rejected the word of God. They experienced life in liberation on the other side of slavery, and they couldn't handle it. Their problem with God's word is not that it's too confining. God's word is too liberating. God's word turns us loose in this world, and God's word says, trust me and hang on. God's word is not confining. God's word is terrifying. It's like dynamite thrown into the comforts of cultural conformity. It explodes the security we find in our routines, in our own thoughts, in our cultural relevances, in our achievements, in our identities. When some people come face to face with God's word, they resist, they grumble, and they complain. And then God's word says, okay, have it your way. Rejecting the liberating power of God's word is rejecting the God who is pure life. It is accepting the work of death. The generation of Israel that was liberated from slavery repeatedly rejected that power of God's word, and they wanted to return to slavery, to beatings, to forced routines, to the threats to their very own children, and they considered these better than trusting God's liberation. That generation died in the wilderness, but their children made it to the promised land. Well, I don't have a great conversion story from which I was liberated from slavery or sin. You know, I accepted Christ when I was four years old. But I learned about the liberating power of God in the opposite way. I was blessed with a very godly family, godly relatives. And my family, I grew up in an environment in which Christ was the source of joy and life. Through Christ, our family embraced higher education, even secular higher education, getting advanced degrees. We embraced music, popular culture. I didn't see the Bible as a prison. I saw it as liberating. Now, I had crises of faith. Of course, I had doubts and struggles like we all do. But my real crisis of faith would come when, when I was a teenager and preachers or teachers would come through summer camps or my church and they would challenge my faith through proof texts and finger pointing. They would skim from the Bible and use it against me to achieve a result that they wanted. Some of you may have been there, right? Right? Uh, it was either a I was either a junior or a senior in high school, and I, I grew up in a great church, Whittier Hills Baptist Church in Southern California, and uh, the church did something a little uncharacteristic, something they probably didn't do again, is they asked one of these traveling preachers to come through and do a kind of revival series, and sometimes these are great, right? But in this particular instance, it was not good. This guy's sermon was packed with guilt appeals designated or designed to convince us either that we were not saved or that we're not fully committed to Christ. In fact, I met my wife in that church. She even tells me that after that series, she seriously doubted her salvation, right? Well, I, I was sitting in, in the back row of the church trying to resist these appeals. And so I was sitting next to a college-age friend, older guy, 
And we would sit in the back and, and the preacher would be going on challenging our salvation, our commitment and all of this. And we would roll our eyes at each other and then we'd snicker under our breath and then we'd pass notes and nudge, you know, those kinds of things. Uh, trying perhaps to gain some distance from the manipulation that was going on. But then this preacher, he was good. He saw us in the back row. He actually stopped his sermon and he pointed us out and said, hey, you know, you guys, you're the guys who need to work on your spiritual lives. Oh, right? So I'm not sure why, but after the service was over, I actually went up to try to talk to him. And I'm wondering if I wanted to challenge him a little bit to push back. I was a smart kid, you know, I thought I was a debater. I could probably get this guy a little bit. But maybe also I did want to apologize for disrupting the service. I was feeling kind of bad. And he was so good, he turned from the finger pointing and he moved into the pastoral confidant mode and really saw this as an opportunity to really work with me. And indeed, by the time I walked away from him, I didn't know which way was up. Uh, for several days, I could hardly eat or sleep. I couldn't study the Bible. I couldn't do my homework. I was a mess. I didn't know if I was genuinely experiencing the conviction of the Holy Spirit or was this some false guilt induced by manipulative persuasion. I didn't know if my Christian life was genuine or if it was fake. In fact, I kind of became imprisoned in his definition of my life as if he knows me. I was paralyzed. Fortunately, through the help of my family members, and through good friends at the church, in fact, the guy sitting next to me, rolling his eyes with me, that was my youth pastor. <laughs> and he was able to help me through this, right? I learned that my distress and my paralysis was not grounded in God's word, in the authority of God's word. It was produced through that preacher's incomplete use of God's word. See, if I'm seeking to be genuinely open to God's word, then I'll find confidence and courage to do the convictions that I'm led to believe and to act upon. I'm paralyzed, I'm imprisoned when I'm following not God's word but some manipulation of it. Does it make sense? I hate that when that happens. I think that's why I went into the study of rhetoric and communication because I wanted to figure out ways to cut through the abusive work of Christianese that did not liberate but imprisons. I needed to be liberated from myself and the surface expectations of proper Christian convictions and what that looks like when you're sitting in the back seat or back pew of a church. Here's how the Bible liberates us from ourselves. In the New Testament book of Hebrews, the author of Hebrews actually takes chapters 3 and 4 of Hebrews to lay out for us the failing of the generation of the liberated Hebrews. And his message to the reader of the book of Hebrews in the New Testament comes out very clearly in chapter 2, verse 1. We must pay much closer attention to what we have heard lest we drift away from it. The lesson from the book of Hebrews in those first four chapters is that the wilderness generation of Exodus is a case study in what not to do. Don't be like them. Don't disregard God's word. And the argument of the book of Hebrews is especially since we don't just have God's word through Moses, we have God's word through the person and work of Jesus Christ. How much greater is our salvation? We ought not dare reject it. It is liberating. In fact, in chapter 4, as we heard read for us, the author of Hebrews tells us about the power of God's Word. And here we can actually see the text. For the Word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked, and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. This is the power, the liberating power of God's word. In the Greek, the verse 12 actually begins with the word living to emphasize. God's word lives. 
And hence, it is active, which means it's fully effective. It accomplishes its purpose. And then you'll notice in, four, in verse 12, there are three consecutive phrases. And Gareth Cockerell, in his commentary on Hebrews, identifies the sequential nature of these phrases. They build on each other, culminating in the third phrase. Notice the sequence. The Word of God is sharper, it's piercing, and it is discerning. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. Of course, in the Greek, the concept of sword here is not a large weapon. It's more of a smaller knife or dagger. In fact, it's probably more of a surgeon's knife. Very sharp, very precise. And what does the sharp word of God do? It pierces that which is indivisible. So the author here is giving us Greek terms, soul and spirit, that's divided. And joints and marrow, those are divided. They're, these aren't separable parts of the human body. We can roughly say that's the immaterial and the material, the non-physical and the physical. But within the non-physical parts of it, within our life itself, God's word is so sharp it can pierce and separate our soul and a spirit. And furthermore, it can actually separate our bones from each other and internally within themselves. The whole person, through the piercing power of God's Word, is finely and precisely dissected. For what purpose? And that's the third phrase. For discerning thoughts and intentions. The Word of God discerns what we cannot possibly discern. In the Greek, the terms thoughts and intentions are so closely matched, it's hard to even distinguish them. Thoughts means bringing to mind or deliberating. Intentions are those concepts and ideas we have. The Word of God pierces even between the thoughts and our intentions in our motivations, our unknown and most secret desires and impulses and convictions. You see, listening to that traveling preacher back in the church in Whittier, I could not properly divide my thoughts from my intentions. I just didn't know I was baffled, I was confused. I didn't know who I was, and I didn't know the truth about my relationship to Christ. God's Word has that liberating potential. It is the power of liberation. And in verse 3 of Hebrews 4, in the presence of God, God's Word, we are unclothed, made naked, and we are vulnerable. God's Word cuts the tangled knots and develops true convictions within us. It also brings us to repentance. It also judges those who reject it. God's Word liberates when we let it fully guide us, convict us, encourage us, and direct us. A traveling preacher didn't know me. They don't know us. They can't divine and pierce the way God's Word can. But we are liberated from the false ideals, the false expectations, the emotional manipulations. We are liberated through God's Word from the belief that we must feel or care or emote in the right way or somehow we're lesser Christians. That's why Proverbs 3, 5 says, we should trust in the Lord with all our heart. We do not lean on our own understanding because we cannot know our own minds. 20 years ago this month, Chaplain K, Chappy K's, Chaplain Steve's favorite movie was released. You know what that is, right? Groundhog Day. He spoke on it last month, even. I think he's spoken on it about 20 times in the last few years, right? The question for Chaplain K is, is it biblical? No. Anyway, you know the story of Groundhog Day, okay? Phil Connors, played by Bill Murray, is a weatherman for Channel 9 in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and he's stuck in Punxsutawney, Pennsylvania due to an unexpected storm, kind of like yesterday's storm. And he has to repeat the same day, kind of like today, over and over again until he finally gets his life right. And the next morning after getting his life together, he wakes up. It's truly a new day. It's a day of liberation. Phil Connor of Channel 9, Pittsburgh, finally escapes from the prison of looking at himself and being utterly baffled about how to live. James Parker, writing in this 
current issue of The Atlantic, loves the movie Groundhog Day, and in an article of appreciation for the 20th anniversary of its release, James Parker distills the message of Groundhog Day to the following, quote, there is a way back through the imprisoning mystery of yourself, a way back to life, end quote. Phil Connors finally escaped from the prison of himself. See, we don't have to live in an infinite loop to escape from the prison of our own befuddlement. We've got the piercing authority of God's word. In a testimony published just last month in Christianity Today, Rosaria Champagne Butterfield describes her conversion to Christ uh, as an older, well not older, middle-aged adult. She had already established professional success, professional career. She'd built a successful and committed lifestyle. She was locked and ready to finish and enjoy the rest of her life. But she came across God's word through friends and preachers and others. And she, when confronted, confronted by the word of God, she asks this question, quote, if Jesus could split the world asunder, divide marrow from soul, could he make my true identity prevail? Who am I? Who will God have me to be? End quote. God's word gave her the answer. She turned to Jesus Christ. He gave her a new identity. When we gradually over time begin to think of the Bible as primarily a prison, a cell that separates us from real life, then we become cynical towards Scripture, towards Christian community, and we become more confident in our own knowledge of the Bible and less open to the actual piercing of the Bible. Our liberation from ourselves and from those cultural expectations that shape us comes through the fullness of God's Word tearing apart our unseen motivations, our confused intentions, and our arrogant assumptions as we learn to be more fully attentive to God's Word, the liberation that we experience then equips us to do good liberation work with others. If we don't listen to God's Word, how will we be able to truly contribute to the liberation of others from sin, from real slavery, from social, economic, or political oppressions, from unjust structures? Without the liberation of God's Word, any other liberation is simply substituting one form of slavery for another. Men and women, God's Word is glorious. It's beautiful. It's intricately designed. It's mysterious. It is piercing and discerning. When you feel cynical or indifferent or fatigued or worn out, let God's Word into your life. When you're studying your Bible theology classes and you've got papers to do and exams to write on Bible theology, can you still try to find ways to let the Word of God be liberation for you in the midst of your studies? as you face the crush of this week of exams and papers, can we still find ways to make sure that God's word and the fellowship of others is the authority that frees us from false and damaging expectations? The word of God is alive and active. Let's be biblical. Truly, deeply, and enduringly biblical.